this man made the statement on the, the CD that, and it, I don't have time to go into it, but he talked about every, every time you present your tithe, it has a testimony with it. Yes. And uh, it's so true, you know, that uh, there's a testimony. And it says that in, in Hebrews, it says that we are testifying that Jesus is alive. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, a testimony, it comes from a witness that in a courtroom causes a judgment to come forth on behalf of what's right. And so every time you tithe and you testify with your tithe that he is the high priest, that his blood is real, he's real, his kingdom's real, he is doing. And of course, as we pray over this, then that, that power goes out, the angels go out, the kingdom goes forth. God, the judge of all, makes decrees. And people's lives are affected by the testimony on your tithe. Isn't that good? Yeah. Praise God. Father, we just praise you this morning. Jesus, we do testify and witness with this today. As it says in Hebrews, that you are alive and you are the high priest. And that from that high priestly mantle comes the oil and the water and the, the life of God. The blood of Jesus that is continually 24-7 speaking mercy from the mercy seat. We thank you that as this tithe goes into the kingdom, as it's used here in Madeira, it's used across the, the world as we give a portion of it into missions, that the kingdom of God is established in the lives of people. People are saved, healed, delivered, set free. They're affected in every level and area of their lives by you and because of the faithfulness of your people today. And so we bless it in Jesus' name as we send it forth. And Lord, we say that your people are blessed, as the book of Malachi says, as they worship you with tithe and offering and honor you, then you are pouring out upon them in their spirit, soul, body, their social relationships and covenants, and their finances, the blessings of God. We decree them a blessed people this day. In Jesus' name, you receive it? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Give him praise for it this morning. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. You've blessed us to be a blessing. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise this morning. Many of you probably know that uh, the president has asked every church this morning to lift up Houston, Texas, and, and what they've uh, endured this last week. Uh, so we're going to do that right now as we pray also for a, a lady by the name of Sandy who is, uh, having, has wa uh, walking pneumonia. And uh, she asked that we pray for her this morning. And so, Lord, we come before you right now in agreement. And we've all watched television this week. We've all seen uh, the things that have happened down there in that area of the country. But we also know, Lord, that you are God. <laughs> and like Karen said, there's no anything, whether it's from hell or it's just human error or whatever it is, that can stop you from taking a tragedy and turning it into a triumph. Yes. And so we ask you, Father, to comfort people there this morning. We ask you, God, to, even though they may not have flood insurance or whatever they feel in the natural realm they need, God, bring divine intervention into their lives. Strengthen them. Give them hope. God, I pray that the church will be uh, even more uh, stirred to go and to be the church among the people there in that area. I thank you that you expose every lie of the devil concerning this thing as a lie. And I pray, God, that somehow we'll look back in the days ahead and we'll see how even though this was uh, something that was disruptive and something that was destructive, that you took it and you turned it around on the enemy and you brought blessing out of it. And so we thank you for it. We ask you to just move in that way in Jesus' name. And Lord, we lift up Sandy to you this morning. God, I thank you that your healing power comes to her right now. We agree for healing, Father. We gang up on sickness as a group right now. We come into that place of agreement and we say, sickness, leave her body. Life and strength be in her body. God, help her to follow that pathway you have for her in life. In Jesus' name. And we thank you for it. Amen. We'll turn to somebody and just give them a good God bless you this morning before you're seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Everybody say it with me, for he is good, and his mercies are forever. Praise God. Glory to God. You know, as we were singing the song earlier this morning about uh, bowing our knee and being before the altar, and Karen was talking about, you know, how as humans we are, are human and we do make mistakes and we do sin. The Lord here a while back was talking to me about that kind of that subject, and he told me, he said, John, uh, you can repent and you can, you know, surrender. But he said, that's all you can do. He said, the rest of it I have to do. Because he, he was showing me how my conception of holiness was not quite accurate. That holiness, we kind of get this mentality of holiness, we kind of work our way into holiness. You know, work our way into a better position with God. And really, we don't. We don't, uh, no more, uh, you don't work your way into being an adult. You grow your way into being an adult. Isn't that true? You, you just grow your way into it. And as you grow, whatever influences around you is what influences you to be the kind of adult you're going to be. Some people never grow up. I, I don't mean that in the wrong. I'm trying to take shots at people. It's true. There's some people that still live at a 14-year-old mentality when they're 40 years old. It's true because of the influence that was around them as they grew into a mature adult. But the Lord was telling me, he said, holiness is who I am as God. We talk about his love. We talk about his power. We talk about all these things. That's all him. And he said, the way you're going to change is get near me. The more you're, you're with me, the more you'll be like me. You think about a little child, you know, a little boy as he grows up, and his, he's looking to his father. To him, his father's like God to him. And so what he watches his dad, whatever his dad does, he does. He mimics him. We're even told in the scriptures that we're to, there's a, a word in the, in the Greek that says that we're to mimic God, that we're to you know, be like that little child, we're to, to mimic him. And so that as that little boy grows up, he starts thinking like his father. He starts saying the same things his father would say or even his mother and, you know, and so forth and so on. Amen? Yeah. But God is in us, and he is the only one that can change us from the inside out. Yeah. He's not going to change us from the outside in from our efforts. That's right. That's right. So don't get frustrated with yourself. Yeah. You know, there was a pastor who was praying on a Saturday night at his desk, praying about the, the service the next morning. Had his, he said he had his head laid down on his desk. He was kind of tired. It was late, and he was praying. And he said all of a sudden, God jerked him up into heaven. He found himself standing in, in the throne room. And he said, man, immediately, he said, I, I just freaked out and got fearful, and I started, you know, thinking of how I, I needed to act here and all this. And he said, I heard the voice of God say, just Relax. I know who you are, I know everything about you, and it, none of that stuff that you're getting all uptight about right now bothers me at all. You can't be anybody but who you are right now. If you're a brand new baby Christian, rejoice in that. That's kind of the fun part. Oh, I won't go into that. But anyway, just, just rest and relax. The more you're around him, the more you'll be like him. Because there's a, a transference. There's a, it just happens in you. Amen? Praise God. So don't let the devil play that game, beating you up, your faults, your failures, your mistakes. The devil reminds me of my past. I always remind him of his future. I don't just take it from him. I give it, man. Amen? Amen? I guarantee you I got the better deal than he did. That's for sure. Well, hey, grab your Bible and turn over to Luke chapter 4 this morning. I'm not saying it's totally true, but I might be able to preach what the Lord showed me this morning before I got here. No guarantees. If you've been around here for a while, you know that's true. But I love it. I want him to say what he wants to say, not what John Purcell wants to say. Luke chapter 4. Very familiar scriptures, I'm sure, to most of us. It's Jesus, when he came out into the fullness of his ministry, and he came to Nazareth. Now, there again, 
the people in that nation had a certain mindset about who the Messiah was and what he would do, and it was wrong for the most part. Even the spiritual leaders had a wrong concept about the Messiah. They were looking for somebody coming in as king on a white horse, destroying the Romans, taking over the world, you know, setting that whole... And that's, that is what the Messiah is going to do as we read the scriptures and we know what he's going to do in the end of time. But they didn't understand Isaiah 53, which they'd had in their hands for hundreds of years. They didn't know that he was going to be the suffering servant before he became the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So as a result, when he came, they didn't understand who he was. Now, God is, God's good. And he's graceful. He understands that we, we can't see the future the way he sees it. So he always sends a prophet, a prophetic voice. He always sends a prophetic voice to help us prepare so that when we come into a spiritual season, we'll recognize it for what it is, and instead of fighting it, we'll flow with it. And so he sent John the Baptist, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, the pathway of the Lord. The Lord's coming, and he sent me here to help you get squared away and straightened out spiritually so your spiritual eyes will be open, your spiritual ears will be open, your heart will be in such a position to where it can understand and receive what God's doing. Yeah. Amen. See, repentance is not always just, oh God, I shouldn't have done what I did last night or said what I said last night, I repent. Repentance means to change your mind or your thinking. Right. Repentance can be as, something as simple, well, like what I was just sharing about me. I had this concept of holiness that wasn't totally balanced, and so God shifted me. I, had, I, I, I repented. I changed and started thinking it from his perspective, not my perspective. Yes. Amen. And so John the Baptist is out there, and there were, you know, things going on, I mean... We saw at the end of Jesus' ministry how in the temple he said, you guys are, uh, you've made this a den of thieves. You're making merchandise of people with religiosity and you're not, this is not a house of prayer now. It's become a den of thieves. There were things that needed to be repented of and changed and all that kind of thing. And, and you won't have to worry about whether you need to repent of sin. The Holy Spirit's an expert at showing you that. Thank God. I love it when my conscience is the Holy Spirit is using my conscience to keep me lined up. Because he's not trying to control my life or put me in a little jail cell. What he's trying to do is keep the devil out of my life from deceiving me and taking me down, killing, stealing, and destroying. I've come to love correction from the Father. And anybody that doesn't is full of pride. Got one, one amen on that one. You're full of pride if you don't. Amen? Well, moving right along. That went over real big. Praise God. So Jesus comes in. He starts doing what God in the flesh would do. Because before he was going to go to the cross and completely undo what was done in the garden in, through Adam and Eve, he came and he gave the people of that nation a jubilee. Everybody say jubilee. jubilee. Now jubilee, the word jubilee simply means liberty. God is not a God of bondage. He's not a God of confusion. His covenants that he made from the very get-go with Abraham had in them provision so you could be free. He made covenant with man to set man free. The law wasn't to put man in bondage. The law was to have a boundary or a fence around our lives that we don't go outside of so we leave liberty and get into bondage. Yeah. Amen? And so Jesus came in. Let's read it here. You've, you've probably read it before. Verse 16 says, He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, went to his home church. Local boy does good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. This was a normal thing. They, they were used to him being there and doing things and so forth. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Now, what's he doing? He's talking about himself, isn't he? Yeah. Because later on up there in verse 21, he says, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. 
this, uh, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty. Everybody say liberty. liberty. That's what jubilee means. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse, ni verse 19. To preach the acceptable year. Everybody say year. year. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now everybody in that room knew that was about jubilee. They knew that that reference in Isaiah, that that word, that verse, was about a year. It was about a time. It was about the 50th year. They knew what Moses' law said, how that every 50th year, as they entered into the 50th year, there was a trumpet blown, decreeing, declaring something. It's the, the Yovel trumpet. It, it's different. There's different trumpets for different reasons and different sounds for different reasons. This was blown over the land, and what it was doing is it was decreeing liberty and freedom to all the inhabitants of the land on a natural level. Yeah. Because every family had its own piece of land as an inheritance that they'd received through Joshua when they came into the land. And if you somehow had not farmed your land right, or you'd had problems somehow where that land was lost, and you had to farm it out, or you had to lease it out, you couldn't, it couldn't leave your family's hands. That was God's command. But you could lease it to someone and they could farm your land and you could even maybe go to work for them to pay off your indebtedness or whatever it was, become an indentured servant. Or you might even have to leave your land and go work for somebody else in a different part of the nation or whatever it was. But when that 50th year came and that trumpet was blown, it erased the board. All debts were erased. I think we ought to have Jubilee in the United States. How about you? <laughs> Praise God. And then, that the first thing it said, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but the first thing it said to everyone is liberty has come, freedom has come. Whatever kind of bondage or indebtedness or problem you were in before, that's over. You are now free. You're no longer an indentured servant. You don't have to stay and work for that person anymore. You may still owe them 50,000 shekels. But you are free now. That debt's erased. Doesn't that sound like God? That debt's erased. Amen? And then there's just three basic things that would happen, and we could read them over in Leviticus 25. We won't take the time today. The three basic things was, number one, you're free to leave that place that you're held in because of indebtedness or bondage in some way, and you're free to go back and reconnect with your family or your heritage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're free to, to have your family unit back together, and then you get also your inheritance or your land back. So God says, you get to go back and start all over with the original blessing, no loose ends, no strings attached. I'm giving you a year, that jubilee year. They weren't to go back and start farming right away. They were to take that whole year, let all the crops grow and fall on the ground, let the animals eat what they wanted. They could go out and pick what they needed to eat, but they couldn't farm it for profit. They couldn't do any of the business stuff. They were to take a year and just take a big, deep, Holy Ghost breath, breath rest for all that time for that year. Yeah. And... Rest and be reunited, be reinstated, come back into the place. They had to bring the paperwork to show that the land was theirs so they could get, legally get the land back. It was a time where they were just to be set free, to lean back and receive the blessing of God again. And then the following year, they would start back into being what they needed to be in business or as a family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus shows up. He walks into his home church and he says, I'm the Messiah that Isaiah was prophesying about here. And I have come to give you in this nation a jubilee. Amen. Now there again, they're thinking about in terms of natural you know, land and farming and all that. But he was talking about a spiritual jubilee as well. Everything he did in that three and a half year ministry screamed jubilee. Yeah. If you were in bondage to sickness, he set you free. Yes. If you were dead too young prematurely, he raised you up. Yeah. If you were confused in your mind and in bondage in your mind and a slave in your mind by demonic oppression or possession or deception, he set you free. 
Hallelujah. Now, I believe there are jubilees even now, uh, spiritual seasons and times, and I know that's a the debate and an argument kind of in the body of Christ, and uh, you might not believe that, but the least you can believe is that Jesus is our jubilee. He's still our jubilee. Amen? He's even more than our jubilee. But I want you to see something here. In verse 19, notice he says, to, I'm here to proclaim, I'm here to decree. See, it, 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 his ministry, if you study this out in the language, he's like a town crier or a, um, what do they call those guys, uh, that the king sends them and then they proclaim what the king has said. Herald. Herald. <laughs> A herald, H-E-A-R-L-D, though, right? Herald. That, that a herald wasn't just, you know, some guy that said, hey, I was over at the king's palace the other day hanging out, and I think I heard him say this. No, that wasn't it. He was an official person. Matter of fact, I, I dug into that a little bit, and he actually had a sword. Kind of sounds familiar, the sword of the Lord in our mouth. But he was, a, he was like a, almost like part of the military type thing, you know. Uh, he was part of the law enforcement or the one who would go out and he would actually stand, you know, in the old, hear ye, hear ye, and all that stuff. And he would proclaim his voice. He was a resonation of what the king was saying. We have that same position. Yes. On the day of Pentecost, human mouths were used, but the words came from God. The revelation came from God. You and I are resonating revelators. Yes, that's true. We yield our mouth. We yield our spirit to God. We let him speak through us in other tongues. We let him prophesy through us. We let him witness through us. We yield to him. We, we pray, as David prayed, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus came and he was saying to them, I'm an emissary sent from heaven. I'm here to release out of my mouth and out of my being the year of Jubilee. Now you are getting ready to see what the year of Jubilee is really all about. All this stuff under the old covenant was type and shadow of the spiritual reality. See, the thing you have to understand about Jesus is his part of his ministry was transitioning people from an Old Testament law mentality into a New Testament thinking and way of understanding. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed in type and shadow. The Jubilee is a perfect example of that. You know, all those people knew about it was, all my bills are gone, I get to start all over. They, they saw it on a natural realm. Jesus came to reveal it on a spiritual level that would last forever. Amen. Not just naturally, but spiritually as well. So we have to transition. So the New Testament, in the Old Testament, was concealed, but the, the, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So we can look at this from a New Testament perspective and understand what this is all about, just like Jesus was. That's why John the Baptist was there, to put people in a spiritual position. So when the spirit of revelation came out of Jesus' mouth and the Holy Ghost began to show people things, they would go, ah, I get it. But see, when people don't submit to that, they don't put themselves in a position to have their ears and eyes open and their heart prepared, then they won't be able. It's not about not wanting to necessarily. That's probably what keeps them from being put in a position. They want to do what they want to do and not what God wants them to do. And so then their hearts are hardened and they can't hear and they can't see. Jesus taught, would teach multitudes in parables. The disciples, the 12 disciples said, why are you teaching in parables? He said, it doesn't matter how I teach them. They're not going to understand it anyway because they've closed their eyes. Their ears are shut. Their hearts hardened. And they're not going to get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So anyway, Jesus came, notice in verse 19, to proclaim a time, a year, a season. Look up in verse 21. He began to say unto them, he began to say, they didn't let him finish. They should have let him finish. They might have got something out of it. See, that's why you need to let me finish every Sunday. Oh, groans and moans from the left side over here. This day, everybody say this day. Now, in the, in the Greek, that, that, those words mean today. Right now. 
Do you ever notice the devil doesn't care if you believe miracles happened way back then or they're going to happen way up in heaven? But don't believe it's going to happen today. This day, he says, is this scripture fulfilled. This scripture is fulfilled in me. This scripture that you thought it was about a certain thing, I'm him and I'm it. And if, you, if you'll see it from God's perspective, you'll be able to connect with it and go with it and flow with it. Verse 22, all, the, all bear him witness and wondered. Notice where they went. They didn't go into faith. They went into wonder. They're like those folks at the, in Acts, two, Acts chapter 2 at the, the day of Pentecost. They, they said, what meaneth this? It says in the scripture. What is this all about? Then, then brother, uh, you know, Mr. Information over here, he said, well, these guys are just drunk. They got drunk too early in the day. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Oh, anyway, I'm going to get off here and too many rabbit trails. All bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, immediately, look, they drew a conclusion. This is not the Messiah. This is Joseph's kid. That was wrong even in the natural realm. Right. Joseph was his stepfather. God, he had the bloodline of God in him. Are you here? The DNA of God was running through his veins. Hallelujah. And he said unto them, You shall surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. In other words, if you're who you say you are, prove it. Whatsoever we've heard has been done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, Truly, I say unto you, no prophet, he was identifying himself as standing in the office of prophet, that's the office he operated in, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you a truth uh, of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days. Everybody say, in the days. In the days. Now notice we saw back over here the acceptable year, verse 21, this day or today. And now we see down here in verse 25, in the days. Now those words, in the days, actually mean uh, a period of time. In the period of time that Elijah was the leading prophet in the land. See, he's identifying himself with the office of prophet here and talking about a season or a time when there were certain people in certain offices and God was using them in certain ways. He said, I tell you the truth, there were many widows during the days of Elijah. What happened to widows during the days of Elijah? Well, there was a three-year drought and many of them died of starvation. He said, many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land, but unto none of them. They were in Israel, they were all covenant children, but not all of them were open enough to receive the man and the move of God in their season and be saved in the season. See, just because God's doing something in the earth doesn't mean you're going to benefit from it. You've got to understand what time it is. What spiritual season it is. Amen? It says, But unto none of them was Elijah sent, and, and, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Now we know this woman was a woman of faith. God timed it so he confronted her when she was gathering a few sticks to make her last meal for her and her son, and she even told him, now, then we're going to die. And this prosperity preacher walked up, and said, well, give me part of your last meal. Oh, the news media would have went nuts on that one. I can't believe how they've, they've treated Joel Osteen this last week. Let me tell you, folks, that whole deal is a nothing but a big, fat lie. Those people were doing things even before the storm happened. They just weren't doing it at the building because there was water everywhere. I'm not going to get into that. Of course, if I had a church, I was pastoring a church that had 50,000 people in it, and it was meeting the needs of people far and wide and across the nations and in missions, I would stir up the news media or whoever I could, too, to try to stop that. Yes. Moving right along since that went over real big. Hallelujah. So he says, in the days of Elijah's office, there were people who had needs that God wanted to meet, the covenant was there for them. God had guaranteed them in the covenant that he would bless their life. He would, he would feed them and clothe them. He would 
heal their bodies. It was all in the old covenant covenant. But none of them were like this woman. She was willing to trust God with part of her last meal and believe the words of a prophet. Yes, 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 yes. Are you here? Amen. Praise God. Then he went on to say, that made him mad, I'm sure. <clears throat> Verse 27, many, there's many lepers in the day of Elisha. Elisha, was, he uh, came after Elijah. With the, he had the double mantle that was on Elijah, that prophetic anointing, prophetic mantle. Many lepers were in Israel in the days of Elisha, the prophet. Now notice, or excuse me, the time of Elisha, the prophet. That word time, it actually means to, to superimpose uh, over the, the natural time element. In other words, Elisha was in the world, space, in the time, the days, but he was living in a place that was superimposed over that, and he could operate in an eternal perspective out of the kingdom of God that forced time and space to submit to him and do what God wanted. The days of heaven on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, we're in, you guys have heard this for years. We're in the world, but we're not of it. What does that mean? That means that I'm alive in the spirit. I'm standing here looking at you through my natural eyes right now, but my inward eyes right now, I can see the throne of God. I can see the th I'm standing before the throne of God right now, inside here. Well, I don't know how to do that. God will teach you. Just ask him. He'll show you how to do it. Praise God. He'll open the eyes of your understanding. I'm not bragging on me. I'm just telling you that's what that means. Elijah, when he came to, uh, uh, to Ahab, and Ahab, you know, who are you? What are you? He said, I'm Elijah who stands before the Lord. See, he, li he lived in that place spiritually. And he let what, what God said to him and where he lived in that circumvent and overthrow and superimpose everything out here. And even change natural law if need be. That's what's in you. But the devil wants to keep us focused on out. What's going on out here? What's blah, 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 blah. How come I'm having so many tests and trials? Oh, did you hear what the devil said yesterday? You've got to get your eyes off of that. That stuff, let me tell you something. You don't have any problems. Oh, Martha, let's get out of here. He's really gone over the top now, this guy. Man. If your name is Martha, I'm sorry. I wasn't picking on you. You really don't. You've got circumstances, situations. Jesus got persecuted. He had circumstances and situations. But let me ask you a question. Did any of them dominate him and keep him from finishing his course and accomplishing what God wanted him to do? Well, yeah, Pastor, but that was Jesus. Well, who do you think you are? Aren't you in him? Isn't he in you? Aren't we learning to yield to him so he can live his life out through us from heaven yeah. by the Spirit? Yeah. Then I don't have any problems. The devil's got a problem. He's got to try to overcome Jesus and me, and he's never been able to do that yet anywhere, anytime, place. <laughs> See, this is the way God thinks. This is a renewed mind. If you see yourself apart from Jesus in any way, you have fell for a lie. When you got born again, I love what Larry Huggins teaches about this. Last time he was here, he taught a message. Oh, man, you talk about powerful. You can't, here's you, here's Jesus. When you got saved, it's like this. We are one spirit with him. And wherever he goes, you go. And if you'll just yield to him, he'll, he'll take you where you need to go. And you'll say what you need to say, do what you need to do, be with who you need to be with. But I don't care if you're, you're having a total flesh out freak out. He never leaves you and he never forsakes you. Once you have your little pity party, he'll say, are you done? Are you done now? Okay, now let's, let's get back and get spiritual-minded here. Get this thing lined up and move forward. 
Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, if you're going to rebel against God and you're going to live out of your own human mind and like Eve, you're going to figure it out and Adam, you're going to, you don't need God, you're going to do it yourself. He's still there, but he's weeping the whole time because you won't let him bless you. You won't let him make your life, you, you won't let him make you into who he created you to be. You'll live a lie your whole life and not even know it. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that. I want to come to the end of my life. I want to be able to say what Jesus said at the end of his life. Father, I have glorified you on the earth because I let you work and, and live through me. So Jesus came to, as much as proclaim who he was as a person, he came to proclaim and decre declare and decree a season, a time. A, I hate to even word, use the word time. A spiritual season that was to operate within time. The word kairos in the Greek in the New Testament is used over in, in uh, remember when, in, well, let's go ahead and turn over there, Acts chapter 1. I think I'm done here, I don't know. Is this helping? Yes. Acts chapter 1, look at this scripture. It's in, uh, Jesus is getting ready to go to heaven. The disciples still don't get it. They aren't, haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost yet. We're cutting them a break here, right? Sometimes we don't get it, and we're filled with the Holy Ghost. So. But it says, verse 6, Acts 1, says, when they, were, when they were come together, see, they're all coming together with Jesus. There's 500 people that had seen him after he rose from the dead. He's getting ready to go up at the Mount of Ascension, and they're getting ready to go into a 10-day prayer meeting 24-7 together, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out. It says, when they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom? They're still thinking that way. Okay, now, since you've risen from the dead, and you, now are you going to do what we've been trying to get you to do for three and a half years? You know, every time they tried to make him king, he'd run off yeah. and hide, because it wasn't time for that yet. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times... This word times is chronos, which is a succession of moments. It's natural time. Or the seasons. This word is kairos, which means what? That which time should enable you to do. In other words, what are you supposed to be doing with your time? Who are you and what are you supposed to be? And what does God want to do in you and through you and with you in that time? Remember over in Ephesians, it says... That we are to wake up spiritually and we're to redeem time. the time because the days are evil. Right. There's this negative flow in this earth. And if you just live your life taking up space and breathing air, you're not going to be part of the answer. You're going to be part of the problem and don't even know it. And to me, the, whole, the worst part is you're going to completely miss who you even are and what you're here for. Now, hang on. I know I'm getting you in, but I'll get you out. Just hang with me here. Amen? Now, notice Jesus didn't say that they couldn't know any kairos or any spiritual season. He said the ones which the Father has put in his own power. See, he was addressing directly what they asked him. There was a, there's a day coming when the Father, and the Bible says that only the Father knows that, that kairos season or that moment in time when that new season will start which is called the millennial reign. He's the only one that knows that. Jesus doesn't even know it, the Bible says. And so that season, God has put in his own power and wisdom, and he's not telling anybody until that moment. And so that's why he said what he said. He said, there are some things the Father has in his own power and understanding and wisdom that it's not time for that yet, and he's not going to share that with you. But, verse 8, what did he do? He immediately shifted their thinking back to the Kairos season that was beginning in their life, called the Glorious Church, called becoming the Ecclesia, the called out ones, the separated ones, filled with the Holy Ghost and power, walking with heaven on the inside of them, connecting heaven and earth on a daily basis as they allowed heaven to live through them. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me or demonstrators of the truth. Yeah. That, actually, that word witnesses there in the, in, the, in the Greek means to, it's like a word that it means martyr. It's, you'll lay your life down 
and pick his life up. He'll live through his life through you, not you, you live your life for him. You've got to give him your life. But when you give him your life, he gives you his life, and then he expects you to actually let him be Lord and live his life through you. Look at your neighbor and say, man, I, I don't know what the price of admission is here, but I'm glad I came. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and all the uttermost part of the earth. So he's talking, you know, he's, he came to bring a season in, a time in, to establish something. Amen? Yeah. Now, we live in that time. We live in that dispensation. We live in that place of being given time from the time you were born till the time you leave this earth. You are in a spiritual dispensation of time where the season of God can operate and will operate through you if you allow it to do. Now your enemy, it's really, <laughs> one way he kills, steals, and destroys is he gets us off track. He doesn't want us to know who we are spiritually. And if we know who we are, he doesn't want us to do what we're supposed to do or be what we're supposed to be. And so he, all the condemnation, all the shame, all the, you know, focusing on your flesh, your flesh is dead and separated from God, is going to get old and wrinkly. And if you eat too much like me, fat, and it's going to, <laughs> you don't receive that word? You want me to lay hands on you? And then... Your flesh, you know, my dad fell and broke his leg again. And he said, I can't believe it. I just fell down and my leg broke. I said, Dad, you have old bones. You don't get a pass on old bones just because you're a Christian. Now, God will heal your bones. He'll help you. But the Bible even says that our body is getting old and wearing out. Now, that doesn't mean God can't empower us. Moses lived 120 years and was so full of the life of God. I'm not saying that you just give up and get old and say, oh, I'm just old, I quit. I'm not talking about that. Amen. Moses was able, he was so strong and full of vitality in life, it says his eyes weren't even dim, that he, when God had to tell him it's time to die. And he walked uphill to the top of a mountain for his own funeral. But, that's still, but he still didn't look like he was a 20-year-old looking good dude. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen? Amen? I don't know how in the world I got off on that. But anyway, <laughs> we'll try to get out of that as soon as we can. Praise God. But there's a spiritual season and a time. God, that's what God's looking at right now in your life. He's not looking at, oh, they sinned last week. Now, if... You have sinned and you've embraced or you've taken in rebellion and wrong motives in your heart and they're still there. It's like drinking poison that's working in you. And that's why you confess your sins. You vomit out what's in you. Didn't Jesus say, if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out? Yes. They use the word spew in the uh, King James, but that's what it means. So, yeah, you have to deal, you know, and there again, you don't, I, don't have to, I don't have to have 15 angels show up in a blaze of glory to tell me I've sinned. I know when I've crossed agape. I know when I've stepped out of agape, when I've stepped into selfishness, or I'm holding something against somebody. I heard Bill Johnson here the other day, he was talking about how he was walking into his church, and this one lady, I'm in so much pain, I'm hurt, I've been prayed for, and I just did So he prayed for her, and nothing happened, and... He said, I'm just standing there looking at her, and he said, I didn't really have any word from God or anything, but he said, I just said, well, are you in unforgiveness with anyone or anything? And she goes, oh, yeah. I, I, he goes, well, Come on. Hello. Yeah. what's the Bible say about that? So she prayed and forgave the person he prayed for, her, and he said within a few minutes she was well. So, you know, we don't play some kind of religious game when we know that there's wrong motives in our heart. But the devil does, notice he doesn't really focus on that. He always focuses about who you are in the flesh and the mistakes you make right. or the, the shortcomings and the failures and faults. He'll go back and find something 30 years ago if he thinks you're dumb enough to fall for it. Yes. Yes. Amen? But God is looking at 
you from the, the spiritual perspective. Praise God. And so Jesus came to declare this season. Turn over to, to Ephesians 5. I mentioned the scripture from over there. <clears throat> now, the, the book of Ephesians, I know I've preached this before, but I, we've got to get this. People are, God send revival. It's here. Right. Revival is a river running out of you and right past you, waiting for you to get in it. But, but see, we have these religious mindsets. Oh, I remember uh, when they had Azusa Street, this happened at this location and this many people. None of that, if you really know the truth of it, it all started out with one person deciding to have revival. It all decided with one person deciding to believe what we're talking about today. And then stepping out into that river of God and allowing that river of God, that those rivers of living water start flowing out of them. And out of that, you know, it's like that little match. You know, you light a fire. If you light the right stuff, it's going to spread and it's going to catch fire. And then everybody in town's going to know something's burning. But it didn't start that way. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So here in, in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm sorry, 5. I was looking at Luke 4 here. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, the book of Ephesians, the theme of this book is the glorious church. So if you want to be glorious, if you want to live in your spiritual destiny, if you want to uh, be that person that walks in wisdom in the spiritual season you're in, now, of course, we didn't finish the story over there in Luke 4, but those people, when Jesus turned that around, and that's what he was doing there when he was talking about the prophets, he turned that around and said, it's not up to me to prove who I am. It's up to you to understand and receive. These other people had prophets around them they didn't receive from, and so even though they had covenant rights and blessings and things that belonged to them, they didn't get them. Yep, right. Amen. Shandai. There's always a prophetic voice of God flowing in the earth in one way or another. It's flowing directly to you by the Holy Ghost. It's flowing through the radio waves, the television waves. Now, of course, you have to discern the voices. You have to judge the prophetic things. Number one, is it scriptural? I don't care if it's only a half a notch out of scripture, then it's not of God. And number two, uh, if you're fellowshipping with God, here's where a lot of Christians get deceived. They don't spend time with God. So... They don't pick up on his characteristics and kind of know how he's flowing and where, what's going on. Uh, if you spend time with the Lord every day and you let him talk to you, you'll come to church and the pastor will start preaching on scriptures you studied that week. Or he'll start talking about things that God was talking to you about. And the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it be established. There's those two witnesses, the Holy Spirit witnessing to you and teaching you. And then God using somebody to confirm to you. And even the operation of per personal prophecy where prophets minister to people in personal prophecy. Most of that should be confirmation. Yes. Yes. Not information. Right. Confirmation. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise God. And I know time and time again, I've had you know, Larry Huggins or different prophets that have come in here and have said things to me that, that I heard from the Lord directly. And then out of the mouth of the two or three witnesses, that's established. I take hold of that. I don't care what the devil says. That's happening. And I'm going to believe the prophet, and I'm going to prosper in what the prophet has said. But see, a lot of people in the body of Christ, they're kind of like that group there in Jesus' home synagogue. Well, let's, let's see. Oh, he said this, but l l let's see if it'll happen. I had a pastor one time tell me, oh, yeah, that, everything that guy's prophesied to me, none of it's ever came to pass. And I thought to myself, you know, I thought everything he's prophesied to me has come to pass. <laughs> really, I was serious. And then it dawned on me, the reason, because I began to listen to how he was talking, that it, he didn't believe it. He took that position of, well, we'll see. That's doubt and unbelief. Now, there again, I'm not saying you believe everything anybody says to you. You know, the parking lot prophecies, you know, where Sister Bucketmouth comes up to you and she's going to, you know, run your life with her prophetic gift. There are people that do that. I'm not saying there's any in this church now. I don't know. If there is, I, don't, I haven't heard anything about them. You know, there are people that maybe they're even called to prophetic things. And we all are in one sense of the word. But they have motives in their heart. 
You know, they don't understand that what God's given them is a job description, not some kind of prestigious position. Exactly. Amen. Amen. See, I see pastor as a job description. Exactly. I don't see it as, I'm the pastor. <laughs> Come and kiss my ring this morning. <laughs> uh-uh. Amen. Humility is what causes us to work and stay balanced and keep me in the right place. Actually, the word humility, to humble yourself under the mighty handle, that means to come into the place in the body that you are supposed to be in under his mighty hand. And then he is able to exalt and use you in the right way. Praise God. So here in the, in the book of Ephesians, this book is actually a... I started to say owner's manual. It's, it's teaching us how to be the glorious church. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is teaching us through Paul. So chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Be ye therefore followers, and that's that word I was talking about earlier. It means imitators. Be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. See what kind of child you are? You're a dear child. You're dear to his heart. He loves you. In the very first chapter of this book, he says about the, the body of Christ, he says, you are highly favored. Yeah. Yeah. Or actually the word is, uh, I just forgot what it was. Let me look. Da, 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 da. Where's it at? Oh, there it is. Verse 6 in, in Ephesians 1, it says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He has made us accepted. Everybody say accepted. accepted. In the be loved. Be loved. Will you please be loved? Yes. Will you please let Him love you? Yes. Well, I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my mind, and my soul. Absolutely. But you're also to let Him love you with all His heart, His mind, and His soul. You're accepted, accepted of the beloved, it says in Ephesians 1.6. The word accepted there is the same word that the angel Gabriel said to Mary when he came and he greeted her and he said to her, you are highly favored. It means highly favored. You aren't just one of the kids in the group. You are highly graced and favored by God. He honors you. Matter of fact, when he created man, it says in Psalms 8, Adam and Eve, he created them and surrounded them with glory and honor. Yeah. I know your little meat computer has trouble with that, <laughs> has trouble figuring that out. But you can't figure it out here. You can receive it here, though. Yeah. You are special to God. You are special. Matter of fact... Uh, Luke chapter 17, Jesus himself said in his great high priestly prayer before he left this earth, Father, show them, and I'm not getting the wording exactly right, but you can read it and it's there. He says, show them that you love them as much as you love me. Yeah. We don't have any problem thinking the Father loves Jesus. Well, he loves you just as much as he loves him. Yeah. Just letting it soak in. Be followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, not operating in fornication and uncleanness and covetousness and all this. And, and, and he deals with some of the obvious things that the enemy always tries to get us to live in and, and have heart motives for. And it tells us in verse 7 to not be a partaker with them because we were in the dark, but now we're in the light. Praise God. So we don't have to walk in darkness. We can walk in the fullness of that light in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. So then look down at verse 14. Now remember, this, this letter was written to the church at Ephesus. He's not just talking to sinners here. But it, it says in verse 14, Wherefore he says, Awake. Look at your neighbor and say, Wake up, will you? You're in the wrong section here. You're in the non-snoring section here in the church right now. Wherefore, he says, Awake, thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give, the, give you light. He's telling Christians to rise from the dead. He's telling them to wake up. See, you can be a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, blood-bought Christian and still be asleep spiritually, still live in death 
Or what, what death from God's perspective here is separation from him. It's just like the word fool. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So a fool is somebody who doesn't believe there's a God. But you and I sometimes act like there isn't a God. Sometimes we allow the enemy to almost convince us by the way we act and the way we're living our life there isn't a God. So we can act foolish. Doesn't mean we're a fool. We believe there's a God. But we can have the characteristics of fool in our lives sometimes. Well, that's what he's saying here, is that a Christian, even though he's alive and full of the light of God, he can be a, that person could be asleep spiritually. He says, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Verse 15, now he starts showing us how to do this. See that you walk circumspectly. This word circumspectly means having full vision all around. The devil is not going to be able to sneak up on you because the Holy Ghost, as the Bible says, is going to be your rear guard. And he's going to show you. He's going to reveal to you. He's going to show you not only what the enemy's trying to do, but he's going to show you who you are and how you need to walk in the fullness, not just a partial vision of understanding. You get your favorite scripture and you get stuck on it and you ignore everything else God's trying to show you or put in your life. And so you take that scripture and you, a scripture and you make it some kind of religious bondage in your life. And anybody who brings other scriptures to harmonize with that so you have the true full light and understanding of it, you get mad and you go start your own denomination and have your own little religious club that goes nowhere. Didn't plan on saying that and not taking it back. Come on, are you here? So circumspectly. That's why I, I pray, God, show me where I'm wrong. Show me what I don't understand. Correct me, Lord. Help me to see. Lord, I, I, I think I see what you're saying here, but I, I want to know more about that. See, I don't spend time with the Lord because I'm trying to earn points with him. I spend time with God because I have to exactly. if I'm going to walk circumspectly. Yeah. Yeah, I've told you my story about, you know, a few years ago, I'm coming up 99. I'd been down in Fresno at this little church, and God had, kept, had me going down there. I couldn't figure out why I was going down there because nobody would show up a lot of times. Usually that's a pretty good sign to a preacher that you might be missing God if you go to preach and nobody shows up. <laughs> but even that can be carnal. And as I'm coming back up the road, he speaks to me. I heard his voice because I said, Lord, am I just wasting my time? It's amazing when you ask questions, God start, starts answering them. We, we are too busy telling him what we want instead of saying, what do we need? And I said, Lord, am I just wasting my time coming down here? Is the season over for me coming down here? He says, you don't even understand your own ministry. And I went, you're kidding me. I've been preaching for 30 years and don't understand what I'm doing? That was my first thought. And he helped me out, praise God. He said, no, I'm not saying you didn't ever, haven't known what you were doing, but he says, where you're at, now listen, where you're at now, season, what I have for you to do now, because God's always moving us forward. He's always promoting. He's always moving us into, the Bible says we're coming into the fullness of looking like Jesus all the time. And he began to talk to me about the reason he was having me go down there and what he was having me do and going to be having me do in the future that I didn't understand that. Yeah. I was still looking at it from an, another seasonal perspective. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are you here? Praise God. You see, churches many times become rest homes and then funeral homes because they don't allow God to take them into what he has for them. Well, we don't want that new kind of music, those young people, the way they cut their hair and the way they dress. And We're not singing the old rugged cross anymore. That makes me mad. I like the old rugged cross. I was listening to it yesterday. Nothing wrong with the old rugged cross. But, you know, if you were those teenagers and you were their age, you'd be doing the same thing they're doing. No, I wouldn't. Oh, yes, you would. See, when people are growing in and coming in, the new generation is being raised up. That's what's happening. Right. And really, that's what this is all about. Yes. I mean, if it's not about us raising up a generation and having them come forth in the fullness of what they're supposed to be, I might as well die and go to heaven right now. Right. What's my purpose for being here? Yeah. But see, people, they put up that, that wall. 
God spoke to me several years ago, and he said, I want you to embrace the youth movement. And I said, Lord, I'm not against the youth movement. I understand this, that people, you know, God's moving among the youth and that, you know, we don't reject them. Back during the, the Jesus movement days in the 70s because they were hippies and they smelled bad and they had long hair and wore sandals or bare feet and came to church. The church went, oh, no, not in here you're not. And many of those kids backslid, got into, you know, a lot of them died young. Crazy things happened because we were too stupid to understand that God was trying to raise up a young generation. They didn't fit our religious box. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have enjoy the things you enjoy, that there's not certain things, groups that you can connect with. See, I understand I'm a spiritual parent now. I'm not that 30-year-old guy that I was when I came up here and started, and Karen and I started this church. There was a certain flow in that generation, and things were done a certain way. And there was, a, you know, some of it was culture, some of it was just our way of thinking. But, uh, but people flow with that, and if you throw up the wall against their culture and shut them down and say, you're going to be in my box from 40 years ago, it's not going to work. I'm there as a parent to help them stay spiritual within their culture. Grow into things spiritually. Not mold them, make them into a 70s person. Dear God, Lord, I didn't plan on saying any of that. But see, a lot of church, oh no, 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 nope, nope, nope. We don't do it that way here. So eventually, you can go visit that church and it'll be like going to a retirement home. There'll be people sitting around in spiritual wheelchairs. Some of them will be comatose. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. And eventually they'll all die off. There'll be five people left in the church. We don't know why the Lord won't bless us. Come on, are you here? Now, I know there's a balance in all of this. I get that. But we need to assist and aid people to come into. Listen, the the people that are in their 30s and 20s and all that, and even teenagers and so forth now, that generation is marked to be a very glorious generation. And we need to help God. We need to work, I should say, work with God for that to happen. Amen? Now, I can go off with my group, and we can go over here, and we can sing my favorite songs out of the 80s or, or you know, my favorite hymns. There's nothing wrong with that. You get with your group and enjoy that. But it's not right for us to try to make people into us when they're not us. Man, Jesus, get me out of this, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me wind this up. Let's start at verse 14. Wherefore, he says, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, Christ shall give you light. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Everybody say wise. I want to be wise. Now, how, what does he say will happen here when we begin to walk in that place where we let him open our eyes, we let him show us what he's doing in the earth. Redeeming the time, that word time there is the word kairos. See, we're not just redeeming a succession of moments. There's a spiritual season. God looks at me right now and looks at you and says, here's who you are, John, right now and what you need to be doing. Whether I ever understand that or not is up to me. He'll give me hints. He'll try to help show it to me. He'll try to he'll try to, he'll kind of push me a little bit into something and say, "I want you over here doing this." And then if I look at it and go, "Well, I don't like this. This is not who I am. I don't want to go here. Uh, I'm not used to this. I'm afraid of this. I'm going back over here." Then I miss my purpose and destiny because that was the next connection for me to move forward through the open door God has before me and go forward into my destiny. If I had said that day when the Lord told me, embrace the youth movement, I said, God, I'm not against the youth movement. He says, I didn't say you were against them. I want you to embrace them. And I'm going to put you in the middle of that, and I want you to be a part of it in a role as a spiritual father to help those people. And I can even learn some things from it. It's not me dictating to them. It's being a part of it, but being in a specific role. Amen? And so now I can finish my course on this earth with joy. I don't become a Christian retiree in a Christian retirement home 
Wishing I was dead and in heaven because I'm done. Shandai. That's the way Moses lived. He wasn't ready to quit. He said, God, you told me I can't go in the land, but I want to go in the land. He didn't say, I'm 120. I'm just ready to call it quits. Did he? God finally had to tell him, no, I'm telling you, you're done. You know, you just, you've, you've finished, so come on home. Come on home. Amen? Actually, the latter part of your life, for some of you folks that are somewhere near my age, the latter part of your life should be the best years of your life. That, from the time you're born to 30 are your learning years, 30 to about 60 or so are your doing years, and from 60 on or somewhere in that vicinity are the years where you take what you've learned, you take what you've earned and what you've obtained, and you turn around and you bless the generations behind you with that. But I see so many people, they retire. You know, they don't, they, they, uh, they don't have, they, their purpose is in their job or in what they were doing. Whatever, and they just, oh, I don't know what to do now. I'm just retired. I'm just, they get depressed. And then it becomes all about them. And they get mad because mo- the kids don't come and visit them. And how come you don't like me anymore? <sighs> Well, I'm getting in trouble today, aren't I? But see, this is the stuff we need to know. Lester Summerall, Larry Huggins used to live in the Bay. Well, he still lives there now. He was saying that when Lester Summerall in his 80s would come to the Bay Area to minister in the Bay. And this guy, when I say he ministered in the Bay Area, it was like every night ministered in the Bay Area yes. in his 80s. Yes. Now, some of you younger folks don't understand what that means. I'm 65, and I'm starting to get what that means. And Larry said that, he, of course, he, and jokingly, he said, that old man wore me out. <laughs> Larry was in like his 40s and 50s at that point. And he said, he said I was never so glad somebody left. And when he would finally leave town, he said he would, he'd run my legs off. He said, I was exhausted by the time the guy left. And he'd get up just as fresh as a daisy, ready to go the next day. But Lester used to say this. He said, there's energy in God. When you live who you are in God, there's energy. There's ability. You can finish strong. Well, this went from, (laughs) I don't know where this went from, but what is, we're redeeming the time here, I guess. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Don't let the days dictate to you. Don't let the devil tell you when you're finished. Don't let the enemy tell you who you are. Stop, get before the Lord and say, who am I, God? What do I do? Where do I go? And don't make decisions based on your opinion. You're going to choose what you like instead of what you need. One of the biggest mistakes anybody ever makes as a Christian is what church they go to, if they choose it. You're going to choose the wrong one. Because you're going to choose one that identifies with where you're at spiritually now and what you like. God's going to choose one that's going to minister to you, and it's going to harmonize with you in most things, but it's also going to be one to help you go to the next place you need to go to. And many times that means the pastor getting on your toes or you having to learn to, you know, walk in love or long-suffering with people or whatever it is. When I got serious with God at 29 years old and told him, I'll do whatever you want me to do, my life's yours, he, it took him three months to convince me to leave my church. First thing he told me was leave my church. You talk about something not computing. It's like, what are you talking about? I, I'm, I'm come back to my church. I, the, the pastor, you know, he even gave me a Sunday school class. I don't know if that was wisdom or not, but he did. And I mean, I'm like, I'm in now, God. What do you mean out? I was out in rebellion for years. Now I'm in, and you're telling me to get out again. Well, he wasn't telling me to get out of that church, he was telling me to go to the place that he knew in four years would, would put me in a position, he would use to put me in a position where he could, tra- he could train me and trust me to start a church. So Karen and I, we had to go by what we knew in here and not by what we wanted up here. Folks were coming into the reason we've been alive. We're coming into it. 
the Lord told me, he's told me more than once, the biggest problem you're going to have in the future is where to put the people. Because the devil's been fighting since the 50s, actually, to try to stop the harvest in the United States and stop it in the world. And God has put the kibosh on him. It's already happened. And it's going to play out. And we are going to see a mighty, mighty, mighty harvest. God is going to have his way. He's never let the devil win yet. Why would he start now? So you and I, if we'll redeem the time, verse 17, it says, Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You can understand what the will of the Lord is for you right now. Then verse 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's how you do it. You fellowship with God. You get filled with the Holy Ghost. You let the mind of Christ start coming up in you. If God prompts you to pray in the Spirit, you pray in tongues. And then God will interpret your future to you. He'll show you wisdom. He'll show you things you don't know. You'll you'll be hungry to hear from him. You'll go to a meeting and the prophet will will pull you out. I've been doing this over 30 years and I've noticed that people that have come to our church that aren't this way but they're just kind of bench warming, they hardly ever get a word from God prophetically. You know why? They're not going to do anything with it anyway and probably wouldn't understand it if he gave it to them. They just shift it over and, and try to set it next to their whatever idol it is they're serving, which is usually them. And see it through selfishness. Uh, I'm, I'm getting in trouble. I've got to preach. Speaking to yourselves, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves. See, you're not crazy if you talk to yourself. That's good news for some of us. Amen. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody. Look. In your heart to the Lord. See, as you're making melody, as you're speaking to the Lord, you know, David's a classic example of this. You read David's life, man, he didn't have an easy road. He was Israel's most wanted, hiding for his life. And you'd read some of those psalms that the Holy Spirit birthed in him. He knew that God was the answer always. He'd grab that harp and start ministering to the Lord. And at first, it would sound like a panic attack. Oh, God! They're they're after me. They're about to kill me. They're going to stomp me in the ground. I'm done. What was he doing? He was being honest with God how he felt. But he kept ministering to the Lord, and all of a sudden you see the psalm just shift gears. But you, O Lord, are my strength. You have set me on a rock. You are my high tower. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, that's what Paul's talking about here. He's saying if you will stir up the Holy Ghost in you, begin to worship and praise God, that the Holy Ghost will get involved with your spirit and he'll begin to cause that revelation to flow up into you and out of you. And sometimes you'll find yourself praying in the spirit. And he tells us over in 1 Corinthians, when you pray in the Holy Ghost or you sing in the Holy Ghost, ask God to give you the interpretation. When I was in New Zealand, I was teaching at a Bible school, and I talked about that, how God will, he'll, he'll talk to you about your future out of your own mouth. That's how Oral Roberts bought, built ORU. Yes. He had the prompting to walk in a field yes. where cow manure was at right. and, pre, and, 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 and pray in the Holy Ghost. And as he did that, the interpretation began to come. I want you to buy this ground, and I want you to build me a college where people will get their learning, but they won't lose their burning. Hallelujah. ORU came out of Oral Roberts' belly. How many of you understand what we're talking about this morning? And see, he could have just said, well, I'm an evangelist. I do tent meetings. And I've been doing this a long time, so it's time to retire. But something in here was still stirring. And instead of him making excuses or just retiring, he stepped forward and said, okay, God, what is this? And he discovered who he was, more about who he was. Hallelujah. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. This young man in New Zealand, when I taught about this, about interpreting your own tongues, I thought that guy was going to launch through the ceiling. He got so excited. He grabbed papers and started writing and started doing stuff. And I'm thinking, well, I must have touched a nerve there. 
that at the end of the class, he came up to me. He goes, man, you answered a question for me. Just bless me, blah, 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 blah. And once he settled down a little bit, he says, I've got this one spot in my little apartment where I pray. And he said, I get down and I start praying in the spirit and I'm wanting to pray for the nations. I'm wanting to pray for people to be healed and helped. And he said, I start praying in other tongues. And he said, and all of a sudden, words in English start coming out of my mouth about me. And I'd go, wait a minute, wait, no, this ain't about me. This ain't about me. And he said, I'd shut it down. But he said, you just, you showed me today that God's trying to talk to me through me and help me see who I am, what I'm supposed to do. There's more. There's more. It's not going to happen just because you show up Sunday morning. It's not going to happen just because you're a Christian. It's going to happen because you are like Moses. God, I don't care how old I am. I want in the promised land. He got there eventually, didn't he? On the, on the trans, uh, Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah. Him and Elijah are standing there talking to Jesus in the promised land. Yeah. That's right. Now, I don't know what this meant to you today. But I know that God is wanting to pull us into a place. He's wanting to pull us into a place in him. We're right in the middle of a season that's happening now. Don't try to, you know, set it up in your mind as to how it has to happen. You'll just discourage yourself. But say, Lord, I want to be a part of. I want to live, I want to live my destiny. I want to be who you're, you want me to be. And, Lord, I'm willing to believe whatever it is you show me. I'm willing to change whatever needs to be changed. I'm willing to move if I have to move. I'm willing to stop doing this or start doing this. Yeah. Don't come up with a bunch of carnal thoughts and lists of things that you think is going to make it better. But put yourself in that place of humility to where God can say to you, John Purcell, you need to leave your church. And you'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> he may have to, it may take him three months to convince you of that, that that's him, like he did me. But the next step, you can't play leapfrog with God. Right. I see so many people wanting to do that. They want to get born again and leave Egypt, be saved. Promised land's over here, but they don't want this stuff in the middle. Let's just leap over to the promised land. No, you're going to walk through a place where God's going to teach you all you need's Him. He's not leading you out there to torment you, beat you up, make you feel bad. He's going to show you that He is who He says He is and that all you need is Him. And if He has to bring water out of the rock and rain manna out of heaven or he has to put a cloud over the sun, or a fire at night by you, he's going to do that. And once you know that, once you, that's established in you, and you know that he is who he said he is, then you can walk across Jordan and look at giants and walled cities and say, you're coming down. Because I'm not going to have to take you down. He's going to do it with me and through me. Father, I praise you this morning. I feel in some ways that I've preached in a lot of different directions today. But God, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the destinies. There may be an Oral Roberts setting among us this morning. There may be a person that you want to use like you use Billy Graham, for all I know. There may be someone that will never walk in that, that place, but yet you've got a secret place in prayer for them. And give, you're going to give them authority to shift the nations in prayer. Yes. Lord, it's not about the stage. We know that. It's not about the limelight. Yes. It's about your will in our lives. And I'm so thankful. I know as myself, as a pastor, as I look across this congregation, I'm so thankful for the ones, Lord, that have answered the call. And that I, I'm able to do what I'm doing and able to be here with them to do what you called all of us to do in Madera, California. And so, Lord, I pray for a discerning ear. I pray for an enlightened eye. I pray for a prepared heart for every person here. I pray, God, as they go home and this week, they just look to you and they just say, Lord, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing right now? Your will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. And I know, Lord, you may just maybe make some subtle, small change. 
Or you may ask some of them to make a larger, more bold change. But whatever it is, Father, that you have for us, I pray in Jesus' name that they will finish their course with joy, that they will walk in that glorious move, that God, we will understand, will not be like Jesus' church trying to stop what you're doing, but we will be those people that will flow with your calling and your jubilee and your liberty in this day and in this hour. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You got something wrong? Let me give you a microphone. There you go. I believe the Lord wants to speak. I have a, I have a tongue to release. Shanta kira la la ba katura sa te, ekshishala ba hashi mala, eku hashi ala ba hango, lastume ala hashi na, langidi asa karka yala kaya ta shi ana nama, engla kaya ta na, nanya la la ta shi ala haya ta buku, ala beha la she, ekhi aha no shama hanta kala sa, bega de hashi, hashavi ata la kati. For I have reached, says the Lord, down into the earth in this day and hour, and I have touched the hearts of my people with a burning fire. I have stirred them from within, and many of you in this room have sensed that stirring. At times, it's been a comforting thing. At other times, it's almost been an agitating thing because you know that there's so much more. You know that there's something right there. There is an open door. And I have moved in you to make you aware of that which is to come. So say yes to me, says the Lord. Don't just say yes to your concept of what you think is in front of you, but say yes to me to lead you in any way that I desire to lead you. Make yourself pliable in my hands. Let me become the potter molding the clay in this day in your life because I'm going to make you into an honor of vessel beyond that which you have been able to be in days past. Yes, this is the day of transition. This is the day of remaking. This is the day of my spirit moving my body from one level of glory into the next level of glory. And the people of this earth will know that you have been with me and that my glory is operating in you. So subject and submit yourself to me. Don't try to impress me. Don't try to do it for me. Don't try to make up a religious routine that you think will get you there. But simply become that clay, that putty in my hands, that which I can mold, that which I can use, that which I can make into the beautiful ornament and the beautiful pottery that I've called for you to be. For you are my vessel. You are that which I have filled with myself. And I'm going to take you into places you never thought you would be. I'm going to cause you to do things that you never thought you would do. I'm going to show you things that you never even knew were true. As you yield yourself to me and as I'm able to work in you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank him for that. Amen. Now just receive that word. Just receive that word. Praise God. Hallelujah. Just receive that word. Praise God. Were you trying to get my attention? Yeah. What? Oh, you do? Okay. Looks like that one's about to go. Here. There we go. I just wanted to share Thursday um, at the food ministry, we were, we were all praying. Uh, we were all praying before we left. And we were in a circle, and we were all praying, but we were stirring, all of us. We were stirring this pot, and it was amazing because uh, we, were, and that's, and we were just speaking about the, the Holy Spirit will speak to you when you come to church. Well, this was really big, and it was amazing because we were all praying different ways, and, and, but we kept stirring. All of us were uh, standing in a, uh, praying in a circle you know, for different things, but we kept going back to stirring, and we stirred for... A, a good half hour, 45 minutes, and it just, I just wanted to share that. Amen. Now, see, that's, that was a prophetic act the Lord had them do, 
he was demonstrating something in the spirit and probably having them make intercession for something in the spirit that he's wanting to do. God's different than we are, folks. He's different than we are. Amen. Yeah, thank God for that. Huh? <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Ron.